they're starting to ask why. So, and when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore, or why, hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? And here's what they did. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord, out of Shiloh, unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. It's just like the times past. We, we go and we look back to our old religious experiences. Perhaps each of us had those. We go back and look at those old promises, those old things, and we go back and look at those things, and we're going to pull those out again. We felt that it was vain this time for the city of Shiloh. It says, oh, they thought they had something here in verse 5, and when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, now watch this, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so the earth rang again. Oh, they could have cried out as a revival, couldn't they? As a matter of fact, they scared them, see. They were scared, and they finally, they said, quit you like men, it says in our verse in the King James Version here, and they stirred up the bravery of Philistines, and they decided to come against Israel. And they smote them. The scripture tells us. And in verse 10, we have this sad account of what happened to the glory of God in the heart of our child. In verse 10, and the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For the fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen, and the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man, Benjamin, out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day, with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. He saw what was happening, and you've heard it before, though, in that culture when they were really just grieved, they would pick their clothes and put ashes on their and this is where he was. He was just grieving at the fact that the Ark of the Covenant was taken. He was grieved over this. And when he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching. Israel had gone out to battle. And Eli he was somehow on the, on the gate there, or somehow on the wall, was watching, even though he was very, he couldn't see very well. But he was watching and listening and just wondering how was Israel faring at this time. And when he came, lo, Eli stepped upon his feet by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled from the ark of God. And when the man came into the city, apparently he bypassed Eli, and he ran into the city. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. But there Eli was, and he was listening. He couldn't see very well, but he was listening, and all of a sudden he heard the cry of the city. He heard the moans and the cries as one person told the other, and another person told another, and another person told another, and another person told another, another, person told another they are. God is God, is in the hands. And a cry rose up out of the city. And when Eli heard the noise and the cry, he said, What do you mean the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were dim, and he did not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army. And I fled the day of the army. And he said, Why does there come my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there had been a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And in this news, and the ark. And it came to pass, when he made mention, even though he lost his son, Eli, he, so Eli lost his son, but with this part, when he made mention that the ark of God was taken, and he fell from off the seat backwards by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died, for he was an old man in heaven, and he had judged Israel for years of the grief, the moan, the whole sin. The glory of God had departed. He had God, apparently, even though despite her influence of living with faith, nevertheless, she still had a heart to groan over these things. And it said that his daughter in law, Phineas' wife, was a child. 
near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings, that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she found herself in travail, but her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, she was going to have a child. The time of her pain came upon her. She was dying over the news. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her, the midwife there, said to her, Oh, fear not, for thou hast borne a son. You don't have to die. These are good things. You born a son. But she answered not, neither did she even regard it that she had a son. And she named the child. Saying, the glory of God, the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken. And because of her father in law and her husband, and she said, the glory is departed from Israel, but the ark of God is taken. For 304 years, the ark of God, the glory of God, even though in their sin, the glory of God was in Shiloh for 304 years. The psalmist says, and he gives this this example to us, and he tells us the example, and he says in in Psalm 78, the psalmist says, when God heard this, all this news here, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent, which he placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity, and his glory into the enemy's hand. David still talks about this moment here in Shiloh, the glory of God the Father. I would like to look at just a few reasons why I believe the glory of God departs in revival. The one that I see over and over again as we look at these things, that I, don't, I could never dare pass the judgment on any of these great men of revival. I don't want to give that idea at all. But there's one thing I know I've seen time and time in my own life I have to go back with God and apologize over and over. And there's something here that always seems as you start to read there, you start to, you know, you start to feel something in your heart and you read about the news of this and that and you feel it. And the one thing over and over again that seems to come through is pride. It's pride. Pride. The attention to being placed off of God and onto man. The attention being placed off of, uh, off of the glory of God departing and coming and speaking to his people and placed and given to an organization. The reliance upon Christ is no longer there and the reliance is given to the organization. Pride. But you know that God said, He made it very plain here. He gives us a principle for us to understand. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God said this. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God solemnly proclaimed this. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God said, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to great images. That's what he said. In Isaiah 48, verse 11, Isaiah 48, verse 11, he repeats that thought. It says, for my own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted, and I will not give my glory unto another? Isaiah 48. He repeats it to another prophet, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Oh, listen, preachers. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, listen to me. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him glory, glory in this, that he understand and know me, that I, and the Lord, which exercise love and kindness, judgment, and righteousness, and nerve. For in these things I delight, said the Lord. Jesus even said, when they spoke to him, in John chapter 7, verse 19, he was speaking of himself, seeking his own glory. But he was seeking his glory and sent him. That thing is true, and none, and no unrighteousness. You know, when we begin no longer to need God in that way, when we 
begin to trust in these, this movement that's happening, or, or, or the, the ability of a man, it, it breaks, our, it breaks our, our need for prayer. It breaks our need to, to cry out to God for Him to speak to us. It breaks that. When I first started the church there in, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, as we were sent out, living little Christian fellowship there, a little church, and we were being planted out there, uh, Brother Mark Brubaker and I went to <coughs> Richard Baxter's, the, the Reformed Pastor. And in there, he, he talks about many things that can, can vex the church and many things that can vex the ministry and can hurt the ministry. And one of the things that Richard Baxter really points on really comes down on us pride in the ministry. And he said this, and it smoked my heart. Here's a quote from that book. He says this about pride in the ministry. He said, oh, what a constant companion. What a tyrannical commander. What a sly and subtle, insinuating enemy is this sin of pride. It goes with men everywhere they go. To buy a home, to buy clothes, etc. It chooses the clothes one wears, the trimming and fashion. And I wish that there were, that was all the damage it does to a minister or the works. How frequently does it go with us to our society and there sit with us and do our work? How often does it choose our preaching subject and more frequently still our words and manner of preaching? But even if this is not all, nor the worst, if it can get any worse than this at all, then every should be said of godly ministers that they are set upon popular air and on sitting highest in men's estimation. Estimation that they envy the talents and names of their brother who are preferred before them. As if God has given them his gifts to be the more, to be the mere ornaments and trappings of their persons, that they may walk as men of reputation in the world, and if all his gifts to others were to be trodden down and despised, if they seem to stand in the way of their own God. It's a powerful word. You know, I think oftentimes it's an institutional pride that will come on. It could be a local church, it could be a big movement, it could be a certain theological point. You know, I often think of, you know, how um, there in the Transfiguration when Jesus was there, you know the story. I what Peter say. It says in Matthew chapter 17, verse 4, and then answered Peter and said to him, when they saw Jesus there with Elijah and Moses, you know it. It is good for us to be here. If thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Oh, may God help us not to fall in that kind of snare. You know, I'm marveled by the Apostle Paul. I, he somehow, many times, was able to, if he needed to, to be able to defend himself. You know, he, there's sometimes when he had to say something. Something has to be said because there was something that was just tearing down the local churches apart and he needed to say something. And he had the spiritual guidance and he had the spiritual ability to be able to say some strong things, even about himself, even about his own authority, things that I don't think I could be able to say. <clears throat> but Paul realized that with all the revelations that was given to him, that there was a great temptation that he was to allow us to affect him in the wrong way, it would put a stop to this. That it would hurt his ministry. That it would hurt what God was doing. A very powerful, powerful passage in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Paul says this about himself. Although he seems to speak of himself sometimes there about the revelations, but also in the second person. Someone had this great revelation. We all know it's Paul. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, because of the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You see, Paul understood that. Some of the trouble that was happening in his life this is from God. For this thing, I besought the Lord Christ that he might depart from me. And he said unto me, God said unto me, What a grace is sufficient for me, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I run the glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, 
I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, God gives us these things, and I am convinced, and I am more and more convinced of this every day, that God does not give us anything that we can own apart from Him. I'm convinced of that. Be it salvation, be it sanctification, be it wisdom, be it anything. God does not give us anything that we can come and stick in our pocket that we can have apart from Him. Provide us certainly. I love this analogy given by Evan Hopkins. He was a big ca- a peasant man. And Evan Hopkins gives us an example in those days. They had that lamp and they had a candle. And he gives us the example. He said, okay, you have to turn all the lights off. It's totally dark here. And I'm standing here before you with this candle. And you can see the, the light on your hand of, of the light of that candle. You see it. You can kind of grab a hold of that candle and see the radiance of that light. Now watch. It's gone in a second. That we can't hold those things of God without constantly being with God. Everything is of God. And I'm convinced that God does not give us anything that we can possess apart from Him. He gives us Him. It's in Him that we have these things. Paul understood that. When we have that sort of thing, it creates a very dangerous self-sufficiency. We've got to figure that out. The second thing that I see that kills your Bible is sin. You know, we, again, we've heard it over and over, and with almost without exception, almost every one of the speakers I have heard have dealt directly with sin, have dealt directly with the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, have almost without exception have dealt with this idea of the problem with being between you and God, or there's sin between you and God, and have dealt with those things. <clears throat> when there's sin, when there's sin, God wants to deal with those sins. But when a revival starts to happen, it begins to be kind of the talk of the town, you know. Oh, did you, can you believe what's going on in, down in the city? Can you believe what's happening in Greenwich? Have you heard this? And people start to gather. There's nothing really wrong with that. You know, a big thing going on, so you gather and you know it. But people are then starting to come to God all season. And the very thing, uh, as our brother there gave, gave that analogy of trying to, to get lower and lower to the foot of the cross, to the foot of the cross, so God can tell us this is God. And it begins to be sort of this almost party sometime. And it seems that when you look through history, that it's in it. Revivals many times in that way. I have a, a very interesting quote here I'd like to read to you. This is again a transcript from a sermon preached in Keswick at a Keswick convention in 1912. And it was given by Jonathan Goforth. Now, Jonathan Goforth has seen, has seen many wonderful things, as you've heard, and, and an experienced revival here in Wells, in India, in Korea, and now he's being called to preach at a convention, sort of like this in Keswick in 1912, and he says this to them. Speaking of the Welsh revival and encouraging them about this, he says this, Jonathan Goforth speaking. He says, God was there. God was there. You, can, you could not mistake it. But then he says this. He says, they have hindered God and well since then. It was not God's will to let things go down in wells. God never got weary in well-doing. There was sin somewhere that hindered God's movement in wells. God is the same as ever. And then, also speaking of self-sufficiency, he challenged them with this. Why did you not believe that he could do the same for England and Scotland? 1912, let's see. Did not Scotland need him then? Did not Ireland? 